As indicated, our theme for today will center around, in particular, the first two verses of John chapter 19. So then Pilate took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. Last study revealed how, when prompted to release Jesus, the Jews were determined to let Barabbas live and send Jesus to the cross. We noted that in the passing that in the Old Testament, we have the example of Abraham and Isaac, which was a foretelling, uh, a symbol of what would take place when Christ came to die upon the cross. For Isaac could literally say, as he looked at the ram upon the altar, he took my place. We then looked at how Barabbas, who was pronounced guilty, he was in the process of moving through death row to the final execution, crucifixion, when Jesus was condemned to die instead of Barabbas. And Barabbas, to a degree, could look at Jesus and say, he took my place. We need to understand, of course, that this was again symbolic. It was representative of the fact that Jesus would die for sinners. Barabbas was not saved in the act of them taking Jesus in his place and putting Jesus upon the cross. We're going to look at that in more detail and what that represented and what that means when we come through to the actual crucifixion of Christ as seen in the two thieves on either side of the cross of Jesus. There are those who will receive the blessings of common grace, that is the beauty of the work of Jesus that filters down through into the heart of every man. There are those who receive the blessing and benefit of electing grace. And that is the grace that saves and places us into the family of God. It's possible to enjoy the benefits that come from the death of Christ. But it's better to enjoy the benefits that come as a result of the death of Christ upon the cross. And we're going to look at that in more detail in um, a few months' time as we come into the heart of the story of the crucifixion of Jesus. So here we have uh, before us in this passage today the after working, the after uh, concerns that now flow from or follow on from uh, the latter part of the preceding chapter where the Jews cried out, not this man, that is Jesus, but Barabbas. And uh, even though Barabbas was a robber, they wanted Christ to be crucified instead. So as we noted, Pilate, with a degree of reluctance, is swept along, he's carried along by the emotional venom of uh, the Jewish leaders. They now sense that they're closing in for the kill. They now have Jesus where they want him to be, at their mercy, and they will show him no mercy. So Pilate once more has failed to evade his clear duty and to make a decisive ruling on the trial of Jesus. He has already pronounced him and he will continue to do that uh, through the entire process. He has pronounced that Jesus is innocent. 
yet he has not had the courage of his conviction to release him. Rather, he is going along with a compromise of truth in order to comply with the wishes of the people. And how often has that been the plague of our own lives in a world that has rejected Christ? Now, there are three themes that emerge in these first two verses of chapter 19. We will just simply look at these briefly as we put together the impact of what is now developing in this narrative that leads us up to Calvary and to the death of Jesus. In verse 1, we see Jesus tortured with flagellation. Verse 1. In verses 2 and 3, we see Jesus taunted with coronation. Hail, King of the Jews. And in verse 6, we see Jesus tormented with protestation. Now we're going to just go down through these, spending a little more time on the first two aspects of these truths and then uh, concluding with a, a final thought on the third. So we begin our study today with uh, the heading tortured with flagellation. And we need to take a, a deep and a close view of what in reality is happening here, particularly in the first and the second verses of John 19. We read in the first part, uh, the first verse, so then, that is, therefore, or because of what has happened a little earlier, where the Jews have said, release Barabbas, crucify Jesus. Now then, that is, following that decision, Following that verdict, on the basis of it, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Now, the thought here quite literally is that Pilate gave the order for Jesus to be scourged. So, this is to be carried out, as you will note in verse 2, not by Pilate, but by the soldiers under his command, under his jurisdiction. Now, we, we need to clarify that clearly in our mind, because as we develop this thought, we will see the significance of it. So, in verse 1, Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. Pilate actually ordered the scourging of Jesus and the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. It is the soldiers who carry out the requirements or the demands of Pilate. So Pilate instructs. He does not necessarily supervise. In other words, for this to happen... Pilate does not need to be present. He has given the orders. The responsibility to fulfill them now must remain with the soldiers who are under his command. Now, if you look at verses 2 and 3, you will see that for just a brief time, the focus is taken from Pilate. Pilate has figured in all of this right up to this moment, he has been the judge, he has been in control, he is making decisions or giving advice. But now for these few moments, the light of truth moves from Pilate to the soldiers. Now I want you to note 
how this scene unfolds. As we do, just bear in mind what had previously happened to the soldiers when they came to make an arrest of Jesus in the garden. Remember how they had stepped back and fallen down before Christ. They were in awe of his majesty. They were humbled in his presence. They recognized that he, not they, were in control. Now we have a different scene. Who is now in control? And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head. It would appear that now at last they have received, they have been given, they have been handed on a plate an opportunity to seek revenge. They will now show Jesus who is really in charge. And they sense that somehow they are in control. How does the world of our time now view Jesus? Is there not a sense of this feeling that perhaps the world is in control, we need to follow it, and Christ is no longer of any significance, authority, or power. And so we reject Christ and we embrace the world. But we need to follow closely what develops and happens in the narrative of this passage. Now they will show Jesus who is boss who was really in control. And so they scourge him and place upon his head a crown of thorns. Now here we need to concentrate in order to get this truth that begins to emerge from these two verses. The word scourge, as it is used here, comes from a root word in the Greek that has the meaning to flog. So the common word would be a flogging. But the word is seen in three dimensions, in three degrees of, uh, of torment and uh, of torture. Flogging in itself was seen first and foremost to be a way of heaping shame upon the person. It carried not only the pain of suffering, but it carried the shame that was attached to it. Flogging under the Roman authorities took three different forms or variations. There was, first of all, the fustes, which literally means a light beating, uh, and it was primarily given as a warning. According to Jewish law, there could only be the administration of 40 lashes at any one time. So if a prisoner was sentenced to a flogging or a beating, it could only go up to 40 lashes. Now, the Jewish people, being very uh, superstitious, feared that somehow in the excitement of laying the, the rod upon the back, uh, they could exceed the 40 and therefore break the law. And so a ruling came in that while the law said no more than 40, they would only go as far as 39 to make sure they didn't miscalculate and give 41 and therefore become guilty of breaking the law themselves. Now you'll find in the life of Paul that there were five different occasions where Paul 
tells us that he received this particular kind of beating. Forty stripes save one, that is 39. This was common to all those who were sentenced, uh, not to the extreme of death, but to a period of imprisonment for breaking the law of Moses. If you read in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 24, you'll find that the Apostle Paul brings that in as he gives his own personal testimony. Now, the other two words that are translated are the word flagella, which we're going to look at in more detail in a moment, and uh, verbera. And these two, to a degree, had a, a similar kind of application. Both of them refer to a much more severe beating. And this particular beating was normally reserved only to be applied to those who were already sentenced to death. This was the final humiliation. It did not matter what happened to the body of the criminal who had been sentenced to death. He was going to the cross anyway, there to die. So this particular beating had no restriction. There was no, uh, no form of, of condition that was attached to it. It was simply given over to those who were to lay on the application of the beating to do as they saw fit. So this kind of beating and the word uh, that we find in, in chapter 19 of John verse 1 for scourged is this word flagella or flagellation. That's the word that's used. We, we want to, 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 to see how this fits in in the context of not only Pilate, but also of the soldiers and eventually, of course, of Jesus. Now come with me to Luke chapter 23. Luke 23, and we read verses 13 to 16. Now here we have Luke giving us his description of what happened when Pilate came out to these Jews and said, I find no fault in him. I find him not to be worthy of death. And here's what happens. Then Pilate, when he had called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, said to them, you have brought this man to me as one who misleads the people, and indeed, having examined him in your presence, I have found no fault in this man concerning those things of which you accuse him. No, neither did Herod, for I sent you back to him, and indeed nothing deserving of death has been done by him. Now note, I will therefore chastise him and release him. Now this is the opinion and this is the will of Pilate. That Jesus be beaten, flogged with 39 stripes and then released. It is not in the mind of Pilate at this stage that Jesus is so convicted of guilt that he is now placed in death row and is on his way to the cross. So when Pilate orders the scourging of Jesus, he has in mind a flogging with 39 stripes. Then, 
having been tormented and having been embarrassed, he will be released to go free. But that is not what the soldiers have in mind. So when they receive the instructions to flog Jesus, they are determined that they will give him the most severe beating. They see him as one who is already dead. Now notice what this entailed. The Roman scourge was primarily an implement of torture. It consisted of a short wooden handle to which several thongs were attached. The ends of these thongs were specially weighted with pieces of lead or brass. They did not in themselves, although they became a part of the act of torture, they were there to simply mean that when these thongs were laid across the back, they were at their most taunt and therefore their most trying and painful. But embedded between these large pieces of weighted lead or brass were pieces of sharpened bone. It were these bone pieces, the bony pieces, that were to inflict the pain and the suffering upon the prisoner. The stripes were usually laid upon the bare back, applied in the main by one or two specially appointed. But in the case of extreme torture, there could be up to six soldiers appointed to lay the thong to the back of the victim. As they would lash the back, they would expose a laceration that could extend deep into the body to unseat the veins and the arteries that were there. And standing close enough to the victim, these lashes would not only go across the back, but would come right around and encase the entire body until the body is now in shreds. The prisoner would be literally whipped to within an inch of their life. Come with me to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew 27, verse 27 to 31. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole garrison around him. Not just a handful of soldiers, but they were all there. No one wanted to miss out on the humiliation of Jesus. They all wanted to see this man before whose presence they had fallen in the garden. They now want to see him bowing down before them. So the whole garrison are gathered around him and they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him when they had twisted a crown of thorns they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him saying hail king of the Jews then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. 
And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. So what is happening here? Jesus, at the mercy of the soldiers, treated with the utmost contempt, with a most diabolical hatred, that has swollen their heart against him. Come with me to Psalm 129 and verse 3. Here we have the narrative of heaven upon what's happening with Jesus and to Jesus. Psalm 129. And let's look at verse 3. The plowers plowed on my back. They made their furrows long. Come over into Isaiah chapter 50. Look at verse 6. I give my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. Over into chapter 52 of Isaiah. Look at verse 14. Here is the brutality of the assault upon Jesus. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Never before, and never since, has suffering been endured to this extent? Jesus suffers at the hands of sinners. But I want you to pause for a moment and come with me into a few more texts of Scripture. First of all, Galatians 2 and verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. Paul declares, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me. And gave himself for me. In the garden Jesus prayed. If it is possible. Let this cup pass from me. But there's no other way. And so Jesus gives himself to the scoffing and the taunting and the beating of the Roman soldiers. And as he stands bleeding and broken in his heart, he is thinking of his own. He loved me. He gave himself for me. Come over into Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2 and verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him. How? In love. Not only did he love us and go to Calvary for us, 
But every moment of every day we live in the security and in the fellowship of his love. Come over into chapter 5 and look at verse 2. And walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. Look at verse 25 of Ephesians 5. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. It is here at the utmost point of agony we embrace the utmost aspect of love. He loved me. Now what did this love of Christ accomplish? Come over into Revelation chapter 1. Revelation 1 verses 4 through to 6. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to God the Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's what the love of Christ accomplished. Washed from our sins through his blood. You may ask what happens to our sins. Where do they go when they are washed from us? Come back into Isaiah chapter 38. Isaiah 38. Let's look at verse 15 to 17. What shall I say? He has both spoken to me and he himself has done it. I shall walk carefully all my years in the bitterness of my soul. O Lord, by these things men live and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So you will restore me and make me live. Indeed, it was for my own peace that I had great bitterness. But you have lovingly delivered my soul from the pit of corruption. For you have cast all my sins where? Behind your back. Picture this. The word of God challenges our heart, reveals to us our need of a saviour, presents to us Christ in all his glory, highlighted in the agonies of the judgment hall and the cross. The word takes effect in our heart and we are drawn by the Father to Christ. We are drawn to the heart of Jesus. And as we are drawn to the heart of Jesus in love, he takes our sin and he drives it out and away and behind his back. And what stands now between his back and his heart, it's the symbol of his sufferings. They scourged him. He was wounded for our transgressions. 
He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was laid on him. And so it is. He had to be beaten viciously. The barbs of the thong had to pierce deeply in order that the deepest stain of your sin and mine be washed away behind his back. And from his back into the sea of his forgetfulness, never to be remembered against us any more forever. We are in his heart. Our sin is behind his back. But there's more. We read in verse 2, not only of Christ tortured for our flagellation, uh, with the flagellation, but we see Jesus taunted with coronation. I want to just conclude with a brief comment on this theme. Look at verses 2 and 3 of John chapter 19. And the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. Then they said, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him with their hands. The suffering of Christ is not yet over. They make a crown of thorns, they place it upon his head. These thorny plants were found all around the region. They are mentioned elsewhere in Scripture. If you go over to Judges chapter 8, for example, you'll see there in Judges 8 and in verse 7 that these thorns were known for the fact that they would tear the flesh. In Psalm 58 and verse 9, if we took the time to look it up and ponder its truth, they are referred to in Psalm 58 and verse 9 as burning thorns. And the burning there is similar to the fiery serpents in the wilderness. The moment they pierced the skin they would release a toxin into the body and that would create a burning sensation. Pain and burning. In Micah chapter 7 and verse 4, the judgments of God upon Israel are likened to being sharper than a thorn hedge. Oh, the fierceness of the vengeance and the wrath of God. When we read over in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 18, we note there that the thorn is the symbol of the curse. And now they take thorns from the heads they weave them into a crown they place them on the head of Jesus and then they snatch a reed a club like stick and they take that and they use it to beat upon the crown of thorns as they drive it deeper and deeper into the brow of Jesus And now the blood flows freely from his head down his cheeks and across his back and his whole body now wreathes in agony and suffering. And the last insult they begin to spit upon him. And now the sweat of his brow and the blood of his body and the spittle of the people are mingled. As Jesus takes upon himself the rod of God's wrath, the curse of our sin. And when this ordeal is over, Pilate again appears with Jesus, with his broken, mangled, shredded body, And in verse 4, Pilate went out again and 
said to them, Behold, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no fault in him. Then Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Therefore, when the chief priests and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, And note, crucify him. Crucify him. And the intent in these words, it's used in an ongoing sense. So you can see that the crowd now get behind their religious leaders and they create this chant and they begin to chant, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Such is the anger of the world against the Son of God. Why did he endure all this? He is Christ. He is our sovereign Lord. Why did he endure all of this suffering? Because there was no other way for you and I to be redeemed. No other way for you and I to be saved. If God could have placed an institution upon the world and said, right, let's all attend these services. Let's all belong to this denomination and then we'll all be saved. If God could have done that, he would. If God could have said to you and me, just go to the priest and confess your sin and he will forgive you and you'll be ready for heaven, then he would have given power to the priest to do that but he could not without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins none it doesn't matter what else we may do without the shedding of blood there can be no remission of sins end of story and if you're depending upon anything else then you're depending upon a false hope. You'll never be in heaven with Christ. Every sacrifice of the Old Testament pointed forward to the coming of Jesus. And do you imagine for one moment that death was easy for any sacrifice? But here the Lamb of God goes all the way through suffering and pain that he might take your sin to the cross and die in your place and appease the righteous anger of a holy God and pave the way to heaven for those who believe. And so they cry, crucify him. And in the latter part of verse 6, we find that Pilate hands him over. You take him and crucify him. Notice in verse 5, when Pilate brought Jesus out, he said to them, Behold the man. What is Christmas all about? What do we really think of when we stand at the manger in Bethlehem? We think about the man, not the baby. Here is the man, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And he carries this burden all the way to the cross because he loves his own. And he has come to die for his own. And not one of his own will be lost. Let us pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for these precious moments as we've assembled around your word. We know how easy it is for fickle minds and hearts to be distracted by the things of the world. 
But we pray that you will write your word so indelibly in our heart today that we will not err in the understanding of its truth. That we will see these events that we have read of and studied with a depth that goes beyond anything that human thought can develop. That we will sense as the Apostle Paul did, the very sufferings of Jesus. Knowing that we enjoy the power of his resurrection, and one day we will be with him, and we shall be like him. Father, write these truths upon our heart and give us grace to know that there can be no other way, no other Savior, we must yield our heart to Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen.